Blender has a couple of ways to add fog to your scene, but unfortunately none of them work on grease pencil objects. In this video, I'll show you how to add fog to grease pencil objects using the power of Python. So you can take scenes like this and take them to the next level. If you use any 3D animation program for long enough, you're going to run into a situation where the program doesn't do something you need it to. That's where knowing a little bit of Python can pay off big. I recently ran into such a scenario when working on a forest scene similar to this one. I drew the grease pencil landscape at various depths from the camera in order to create a multiplane effect as the camera dollied forward. But I hit a snag when I wanted to add some fog to the scene. There are two ways to add fog in Blender, using a volumetric shader or a mist pass. Unfortunately, neither of these methods work on grease pencils. Thankfully, generating fog isn't a terribly complicated process. In fact, if you followed along with my previous tutorial, you have most of the tools you need to create fog on your grease pencil objects. The process of adding fog to our scene is relatively straightforward. Fog in the real world is caused by water vapor or other substances in the air. The further from us an object is, the more water vapor we must look through to see it, and thus the lighter the object gets. With that in mind, we have the general methodology we need in order to plan out our script. First, we must figure out the distance of our grease pencil strokes to the camera. Then we'll move the color of our grease pencil strokes towards our fog color based on the distance, with objects further away from the camera moving more towards the fog color than strokes closer to the camera. We want the ability to adjust the fog creatively, so with this in mind, we'll add controls for adjusting the various parameters of the fog based on each stroke's depth. I'm starting with a 2D animation scene with some grease pencils in it, one for the forest and one for the deer. I also have an animated camera pushing into the scene slightly. You can try this on your own scene, which can be anything you like, as long as you have one or more grease pencil objects with their strokes set to different depths. To create a simple test scene, you could create a grease pencil object and use the rectangle tool to draw some strokes, and then switch into edit mode and translate the individual strokes back in depth. To start our script, let's split our view and add a text editor and then hit the new button to create a new text file to add our code to. As we've seen in previous tutorials, the first order of business is to get the selected grease pencil object and then tunnel down to the points or strokes. So I put a link in the description to a bit of starter code that's a good starting point for coding against our grease pencil objects. We'll paste that code into our text editor and give it a test run with our grease pencil selected to make sure it works as expected. We can toggle the console output to see the shell and see that it has printed out the position of each point in our grease pencil. Before we can get down to brass tacks with adding the fog, we need to have our code manage the objects in our scene. In this script, we need to know which of our objects is the grease pencil and which is the camera. So we'll set it up so that the user has to select one or more grease pencils and one and only one camera. We'll begin teasing out the selected objects by checking their type. Those objects with the type G pencil gets added to a grease pencil list, and those with the type camera get added to the cameras list. We'll then add some error checking to make sure that there's at least one grease pencil selected, as well as one and only one camera selected. If these criteria are not met, the script prints out the error and stops executing. Otherwise, we proceed to the main body of our script. We'll cycle through each grease pencil in our grease pencils list to add the fog, in doing so, we'll be making a lot of changes to the drawing, so to give the user the ability to go back to their original drawing, we'll duplicate any selected grease pencil objects and perform our changes on the duplicate. To keep things tidy, we'll create a duplicate function into which we'll pass our object. In addition to duplicating the object, we'll potentially need to copy its data, animations, and which collection it lives in, so we'll add parameters for that with a default value of true. Inside our function, we'll copy the object using its built-in copy function. Then we'll copy the object's data. Blender stores animation information in an object's actions, so we'll copy any actions that it might have. We'll then link the copied object to the collection that has been passed in as an argument. And lastly, we'll rename the duplicate object with the suffix fog. At this point, we have duplicate objects, but they still share the same materials as the original, which means that any material changes we make to the copy would also affect the original. To fix this issue, we'll get a list of materials from the copied object's materials attribute, and then we'll cycle through that list and make a copy of it with its copy function, and we'll rename it with the suffix underscore fog. 
The stroke is associated with a material by an index number only. Therefore, it's important that the material list on our object copy have the same number of materials in the same order as the original. The simplest way to do that is to just replace the current material with the duplicated material in our materials list. This way, the new strokes will automatically reassociate themselves with the new materials. Back in the main body of our code, we'll add a call to our new duplicate function. We'll pass it our grease pencil object as well as the collection it lives in. We get its collection by querying the original object's user collection list and getting the first item in the list. Next, we'll hide the original grease pencil object by setting the hide viewport and hide render attributes to true. This hides them from both the viewport and rendering. Now we're ready to give our code a test run. We select the grease pencil objects we want and one camera. Now we have duplicate grease pencil objects in our scene with the suffix underscore fog. But unfortunately, we've also run into a bug in the Python API. Let's say that we wanted to return back to our original grease pencil objects and rerun the script. We should be able to delete the objects and turn on visibility of the originals by clicking on the eye icon in the outliner. But doing so has no effect at the moment. It remains hidden. To turn back on the visibility of the originals, we need to go into its object properties and under the visibility section, check the viewports checkbox. Now we can see our original objects again. The render icon seems to function fine, it's just the viewport visibility that has this issue. There are probably ways around this, but it would bog down our code and make things confusing for now. So for the purposes of this tutorial, we'll just live with it and fight that battle another day. In order to calculate the distance from our grease pencil strokes to the camera, we need to know where the camera is. So we'll create a new function to do this called getCamPosition, into which we'll pass a camera. We'll also be passing in a frame parameter so we can query the camera's position without actually having to change the timeline to that frame. We'll start by initializing a variable for the location with zero values for x, y, and z. If an object is animated, the animation data will be located in an attribute called animation data. If there is data, then we check the action attribute and get the action's name. We then fetch that action from the bp.data by name. Next, we cycle through any F curves on the action and call the evaluate method on them, which returns the value for any animated attributes for the given frame. We then tease out the location of the curve values and add them to our location variable. If the camera is not animated, the process of getting its position is much simpler. We query the camera's location attribute and we're done. Now that we have a function for getting the camera's position, we can call it from the main body of our code. Because every frame of a grease pencil object is effectively a new drawing, we want to get the camera's position anytime there's a new keyframe on the grease pencil object. So we'll add our call to the cam position function just as we start cycling through our grease pencil frames. To determine which frame the grease pencil's keyframe is on, we'll query the frame's frame number attribute and pass that to our get camera position function. And we'll store the position in a cam position variable. If we add a print statement and run the code now, we should see the camera's position printed to the shell. In my scene, it printed out multiple times because I have multiple layers on my grease pencil object. Before we dive into changing our stroke colors, let's take a quick look at how Blender applies color to grease pencil strokes. All grease pencils must have a material to render properly. This material controls whether we see the stroke, the fill, or both. The material also sets the look of the grease pencil, determining whether they are rendered as dots, lines, textures, gradients, etc. The user has two ways of defining the relationship between the material and the vertices of the stroke. Using a button on the top toolbar, they can draw in either material or vertex paint mode. When using the material mode, the strokes draw exactly as they're defined in the material and remain connected to that material. If the material is changed later, the strokes update as well. If the user clicks on the vertex paint mode button, Blender uses the color swatch next to it to define the color of the stroke. When using this mode, the material no longer affects the color of the stroke or the fill, but it still affects the other attributes. Back in our scene, we'll start by adding some variables to control our fog. We create min and max distance variables to specify the range within which the fog will be applied. We'll also create a tuple for our fog color, which contains the R, G, and B values, as well as an alpha value. It would also be handy to be able to control the overall strength of the fog effect, so we'll add a fog multiplier variable. And then we'll compute a final fog color by multiplying this variable times the fog color values. Lastly, we'll define a falloff variable which controls how quickly objects fade off into the fog. 
further down in the code, at the stroke level, we'll add a call to our yet to be created function called addFog and we'll pass in our settings. Now we'll start creating our addFog function. We'll pass in the grease pencil stroke, the camera position, the min and max fog distances, the fog color, and the fall off. Because the fog color is dependent on the stroke's distance to the camera, the first order of business is to determine the position of the stroke. As we've seen in previous tutorials, strokes don't have transforms of their own, so we'll borrow a function from these tutorials called get center pivot. This function gets the position of all the points in the stroke and then calculates the average position. This will give us a reasonable approximation of the center point of the stroke to use in our distance calculations. Now that we have the positions of our camera and stroke figured out, we can compute the distances between them. We'll create a new variable to hold the computed distance and a call to our yet to be created function called getDistance. We'll pass in our camera position and stroke position, but as we pass them in, we'll convert them to vector objects so we can do the vector math on them inside the function. Because we've already converted our positions to vector objects, our getDistance function becomes super simple. We pass in the two positions. And then in our return statement, we subtract the first position from the second and query the length attribute on the resulting vector. The vector library takes care of the rest. If we now print out the computed distances, we can see the depth of each stroke from the camera. In order to compute the amount of fog for any given distance, we'll need to normalize that distance based on the min and max distances of our fog. I discussed normalization in my previous tutorials, so I won't belabor it here but we'll borrow the normalize function again to make things easy. We'll then pass our distance into the normalize function, as well as the min and max fog ranges. This will return a value between zero and one where the distance of our stroke lies along that scale. And now we're finally ready to start changing the color to simulate our fog. In order to preserve the user's current settings, we need to change the color of both the materials associated with each stroke and the colors on the stroke itself. On each of these, we'll need to set the colors for both the fill and stroke. We'll start by setting the colors on the stroke's points first. We begin by capturing the current color of the point by getting its vertex color attribute. We convert it to a vector object and store it in a variable. To calculate the fog, we need to move the current color towards the fog color in a proportional manner. For the time being, let's assume our fog color is white, that is an RGB value of 1. For each of our channels, we can calculate the difference between our fog color and the current color by subtracting the current color from the fog color. To apply the proportionally correct amount of fog based on distance, we now simply multiply this difference by the normalized distance. If we're to use this formula as is, we'll get a linear falloff to our fog. To make this an exponential falloff, we raise the normalized value by an exponent. Now that we have our formula working, we repeat this formula on each of the channels. Lastly, we assign back the results to our points vertex color attributes. One important thing to note here is that we're using the alpha value from the original point color. This is important because the alpha is what Blender uses to determine whether a point is affected by the material or not. If the alpha is set to zero, Blender uses the material to drive the color. If it's set to anything else, it uses the vertex color mode. Therefore, using the old value allows the user to retain the connection to the material if needed. A special shout out to Sietze Brower who helped me figure this out on Blender Stack Exchange. Changing each point's vertex color attribute modifies the stroke color, but to modify the fill color, we need to change the fill color attribute on the stroke itself. To do this, we'll query the stroke's vertex color fill attribute the same way we did for the points. We use the same formula and we set the results back to the vertex color fill attribute. Again, we preserve the original alpha value to retain the material connections. Because we're retaining links to the original material, we must also apply our fog to the stroke's material as well. First, we get the material by querying the current stroke's material index and fetch that from the grease pencil's material list. The stroke color on the material is in the color attribute, so we apply our fog formula based on those values and set them back to the color attribute on the material. The fill material is on the fill color attribute, and we set the fog on it in the same way. Now we have everything in place to test our script. We select our grease pencil object and our camera and run the script. And now our scene has a lot more mood to it. Our script is almost ready to go. There's just one minor issue. 
When working on my scene, I noticed that the deer wasn't picking up the correct amount of fog compared to the other objects in the scene. I eventually tracked this down to an issue with my distance calculation. The deer is on its own grease pencil object that I drew in another file and then appended to this one. To place the deer in the forest, I didn't move the strokes to the correct depth in edit mode, but rather I just moved the whole grease pencil object. To see why this confused my distance calculation, we can take a look at our get center pivot function. For each point in the stroke, we query the points.co attribute. This returns the point's position, but it returns the point's local position. It doesn't take into account the grease pencil's transforms. Because the deer was moved into the position in the grease pencil level, as far as our script is concerned, the deer is sitting at the origin. To fix this, we need to get each point's world position instead of its local position. To do this, our get center pivot needs access to the grease pencil object's transforms. So in the main body of our code, we'll add a parameter to the add fog call where we pass in the grease pencil GP. We'll add that to the add fog parameters, to the call to the get center pivot, and to the get center pivot function itself. Now our grease pencil object is being passed all the way down to where we compute the stroke's position. Inside the get center pivot, we can now modify it to get the world position of each point. We'll start by grabbing the .co values and storing them in a variable called plocal. We'll compute the global position by combining the grease pencil's matrix world value by the values in plocal and store that in a plocal variable. Then we simply switch out our calls to p.co with plocal. Fix a typo and voila. Now that our fog is working, we can adjust the settings however we want. The scene seemed like it could use a bit of a warmer fog, so I reduced the amount on the blue channel to warm it up a bit. But we could just as easily imply a forest fire, or the gates of hell, or Pandora, or, well, you get the picture. Have fun playing with this and let me know in the comments what you think. Thanks for watching.